wisdom lesson this morning is from Dr. Amy Hemel Zabin's Conversations with a Pedophile. And just for a little context, one reviewer described it as a convicted and now remorseful pedophile explains how he selected his victims, earned their parents' confidence, and then manipulated the youngsters' emotions to gain control over them. I saw myself as a person who, through no fault of his own, was deprived of a normal life. And as I convinced myself that I had been somehow cheated by fate, I felt I had a license to do anything I chose to. If I didn't play by their rules, why should I? I was never allowed to play in their game. If I wanted to force some smaller child into having sex, why shouldn't I? After all, I was the real victim here, not him. This self-created and self-serving sense of victimization allowed me to do anything that I desired without the slightest twinge of guilt, shame, responsibility, or remorse. A little less than a decade ago, Peter Newman, an assistant director of Kennecut Camps in Branson, turned himself into poli the police after admitting to having had sexual contact with young boys at that camp for many years. Peter was well liked both by the young campers and their parents. He interacted well and went way out of his way to play midnight basketball and other extra activities with the often very bored campers at this Baptist church camp. But his activities also led to things like naked hot tub Bible studies, which is as much as I would like to say about Peter Newman. It wasn't until the mid-1990s that the cases of sexual abuse committed by Catholic priests began to dominate the news, but a full decade earlier, society had begun to talk about child abuse more publicly. And when the documentaries began to hit TV, my phone started to ring with requests for appointments to talk about childhood traumas that had remained hidden, in some cases, for 40 or 50 or even 60 years. Pedophilia was not invented by Catholic priests in the last half of the 20th century, but it was a topic so riddled with shame and confusion that almost no one wanted to talk about it. I was in grad school studying pastoral counseling in the early 80s, and so we talked a lot about this topic, but I'm afraid that a lot of what I was taught did not survive later research and professional thinking. My professors were right about the numbers of victims when they told us that one in four and possibly one in three, both boys and girls, were sexually molested prior to their age of consent. But they were wrong about two important things. The first was the suggestion that there were a lot of pedophiles lurking in families, the Boy Scouts, Big Brothers, foster care, churches, and YMCAs. The more accurate fact is that pedophiles are fairly rare. It's just that each one will, in the course of their lifetime, have between 200 and 1,000 victims, in which case it does not take very many offenders to victimize a whole lot of people, which also goes to how hard it is to detect who might be a likely pedophile. Secondly, I was told that virtually all offenders were victims as children. My textbooks were confident on this point, and this appears to not be true. My friend Josie Rose recently sent me a copy of a book that has been important to her clinical psychology practice. And it bears the creepy title, Conversations with a Pedophile, but it's a book written by a therapist who was a childhood victim herself, and she is interviewing prisoners who had spent years grooming and seducing children. And the, the one pedophile that is featured in this book uh, says that he had molested more than a 1,000 young boys. I have asked my friends, Paul Tomlinson and Jesse Rose, to join me in this presentation because, quite frankly, I have more questions than I have answers on this topic. And I would like to solicit their professional views about how we allow our children 
to have the security of having lots of adult mentors while we at the same time do everything we can do to keep them safe. And I want to use my own family as an example of the problems posed by both a lack of awareness and the hyper level of fear when it comes to child sexual abuse. In those halcyon days of my own youth in rural Kentucky, our school nurse would come around once a year and tell us not to take candy or car rides from strangers. They never told us why. I assumed it had something to do with tooth decay. <laughs> Even as a young elementary student, I could walk from my school to the church where my mother was the secretary, drop my books, and walk all over town as long as I was back at the church by 5 o'clock when she closed the office. During the summer, my neighborhood friends and I would jump on our three-speed Stingray bikes and ride as far away as Mammoth Cave National Park, spend the day hiking with international tourists until time to ride the 30 miles back home for dinner. No one ever asked me, did an adult try to talk to you? Did anyone try to touch you? In the neighborhood, there were other fathers and grandfathers who knew who knew my dad well enough to know that if I was ever going to see a movie or go to a, a circus or a parade, that they would have to include me in one of their family outings, which they did regularly and generously. So far as I knew as a child, all adults were benevolent parent figures from whom I had nothing to fear. By the time I had become a parent, though, I'd been taught to view the world as being nearly full of pedophiles, full of dangers. So when I adopted my daughter, I always knew where she was and who she was with. And I would subtly question her after every new babysitter or teacher or coach or church youth sponsor had spent time with her. I instilled distrust in her, telling her much more than she needed to know to make her wary of every adult that she ever encountered. My own professional position as a parish pastor has become increasingly difficult through the years because so many scandals, like the one I mentioned where I began, are rooted in church experiences. Pastors in churches have had to become so guarded that we hardly have youth programs anymore. Religious education just about doesn't happen for children. When I entered the ministry, I could round up three or four boys in the summertime, go on camping trips, go out to the circus, other events all summer long. But even then, one of my professors used to sum up her lectures on sexual misconduct saying, you don't have to be guilty, you just have to be accused. Now most children grow up with almost no close contact with adults beyond their immediate family and sadly, that is exactly where most child abuse does take place, within families. Nothing frightens, disgusts, or enrages us as much as sexual abuse. And yet, how can we simultaneously protect our kids while allowing them to have a secure childhood full of trustworthy adults? How can big brothers and big sisters recruit adult mentors in this environment of fear? How do you get Sunday school teachers? How do you get Boy Scout leaders? And how do you get parents who have the confidence even to let their children experience these growing opportunities in this environment of fear? What I think we can say with confidence is that almost everything that we've done up to this point has been wrong. We have tarred every volunteer mentor with the same brush as those Catholic priests that molested children. We've not figured out how to protect kids while still giving them a great life full of trustworthy adults. The other thing that I think if we, if we had made this a weekend conference instead of a Sunday morning service is I think most of us have a trigger reaction when we hear of pedoph uh, pedophilia is that we want to punish the perpetrator. It's always about punishment. It's about longer prison sentences. It's about expanding the definition of sexual misconduct to, uh, 
include people that urinate in a public park or, or who watch uh, uh, inappropriate porn on their, on their internet, we put them in prison for longer and longer time because we are so afraid of the event itself. But there's not very much conversation about what helps the victims to actually recover. And that's where we as compassionate people really have to start to redouble our efforts. Punishment is a form of social revenge that's rooted in our own fear. What we need more of is healing. Healing for perpetrators and healing for victims. That's what I have to say, Josie, it's up to you. Hi, I can honestly say I never thought I'd find myself at a church on a Sunday speaking about pedophiles. But then again with Roger, you never know what, you, what you'll get yourself into. <laughs> Um, I want to apologize ahead of time if this seems a little scattered. As much as I admire Roger and his ability to present these topics, I'm not much of a public speaker, so bear with me. Anyway, let's get to the point. I want to start by stressing that junior sex offenders and pedophiles are two different ballgames. With junior sex offenders, their way of thinking has yet, not yet quite set into the lifestyle that a pedophile has come to know and learn to survive. Today you will hear me talk more about junior sex offenders, for there is a high recovery rate for junior sex offenders, and I believe this is the area that is the most important to address to proactively avoid more potential pedophiles and victims. Speaking of the word of avoid, that brings up the next word I wanted to address, which is avoidance. Avoidance is a powerful word in action. That is one of the biggest problems associated with this topic and problem today. We tend to avoid things that we find to be uncomfortable, shocking, offensive, sickening, and the list could go on. I understand this desire to avoid. I know avoidance is both for the fact that it is uncomfortable and an attempt to protect innocence from being exposed to such a terrible thing. The only thing you are protecting, though, is your own denial. Our avoidance teaches our kids that the topic is bad or dirty. Our avoidance leads to kids too scared to tell us what has been done to them. Our avoidance prevents us from educating ourselves and being able to teach our kids how to protect themselves and what to do. Our avoidance shames pedophiles and prevents pedophiles, or even potential pedophiles, from coming forward and asking for help. So don't avoid. Confront the, problem, confront the problem head on. Educate yourself. Educate your child. Explain the signs of being groomed. Tell them what to look for, what behaviors are okay, and what appropriate and inappropriate touching are. Have the sex talk. Worry the sex talk is too soon? I have kids come to sessions and tell me things that I don't even know. You know why? Take a look around. We are surrounded by a sexualized society. It's in movies, it's everywhere. I still see porn magazines at some gas stations. Even if you do manage to avoid that kind of exposure, social media, their friends and classmates are telling them about it. Best protection is awareness. Okay. I did my, inter I did my internship for two years working with junior sex offenders. A majority of junior sex offenders who perpetrated against their victims lacked appropriate education. Some were perpetrated against themselves. Oh, sorry, some were perpetrated against and some weren't. Yes, I believe there are some people who are naturally born pedophiles, but many of the kids started out as simply lacking education in the matter, and whether it was being offended on themselves, hormones, or inappropriate exposure, they simply acted out of confusion in an attempt to understand. If not addressed, though, this can easily escalate to the lifestyle and mindset we know as pedophilia. This topic is extensive, and I could go on. But to not take up too much time, I found an article with grooming signs that you can access. I will send this to you later, Roger. Um, I will not go into detail about these, but I do want to stress the importance of recognizing these signs and teaching your kids about them. Pedophiles do not typically act right away. They go through a process. The type of kids most likely to fall victim to pedophiles are shy, withdrawn, and appear to be the perfect candidates for keeping secrets. Pedophiles groom and set up little tests to see how the kids react or if they tell their caregiver. With time, they manipulate and isolate the kid into becoming the perfect victim. So it's also important to not just educate yourself or your kids about these different facts, but it's also important to provide an environment where a kid feels safe and encouraged to express their feelings, especially the negative ones. Encourage your kid to talk and express themselves. Be able to sit with them and handle the difficult feelings. Don't verbalize or role model an aversion to negative feelings. Be someone they feel comfortable enough to talk to about the stuff that feels even dirty or shameful. Along those lines, 
I know a lot of people try to educate themselves and soak up these facts so that they feel more equipped to protect their kids from others. So I just want to say something. I am not just talking about protecting your kids from others. I'm also talking about potentially protecting your own kid from being a perpetrator. This is something that's seen as so atrocious or horrible or, e or horrible to even consider of our own kids. So once again, we avoid. Once again, only thing your denial is protecting is yourself. Don't turn your eye to the signs you might see in your own kid. Everyone is the first to believe it is not their kid. Sometimes it is, though. Recovery is high for juveniles. Be willing to see the signs. Be willing to let your kid turn to you with those impure thoughts without attaching shame and be willing to seek out the help needed. I worked for a woman who ran a program where she worked with the pedophiles going through the court system. I had the privilege to be able to study her files on them. The primary theme I noticed in each file was a sense of developed insecurity, shame, and feeling different. There is so much shame around pedophilia. I felt ashamed even to mention that I worked with sex offenders, let alone enjoyed it or actually liked some of my clients. I can only imagine how they felt. This is what causes pedophiles to not want to talk. The shame surrounding this topic causes kids to not want to share if they have been violated. Teenagers to come forward to talk about their temptations to touch a kid. For adults to not come forward for help, but rather keep justifying their lifestyle and in the meantime further building up the grooming skills and further becoming more experienced and advanced in this lifestyle. Pedophiles already feel different than others. Pedophiles feel isolated from society in their own way. It is this feeling of being so different than others, which is driven by shame and insecurity that further enables their continued lifestyle and isolation from others. We cannot catch every pedophile and we cannot help those who are not willing to ask for it. We cannot help what we are not willing to hear. Our shame and avoidance are not what will help alleviate this problem. On that note, I will end with this. People often say, I can never do that, and then ask how I do what I do when working with people like that. Easy. I don't see someone as a sex offender or a pedophile. I see someone who once was a kid and maybe even a potential victim themselves. I see someone who likes mushrooms and olives with a pepperoni pizza, too. I see a fellow animal lover or someone who has their own loved one they, feel they fiercely love and protect. I see a person. So don't let your fear and awareness cause you to lose compassion. That is still a person. That is still a person who hurts. That is still a person who bleeds. There's a child that once stood a chance behind that person. Losing our sense of self and compassion could have potentially led us down a similar route. So as Dave Willis once said, show respect even to the people who don't deserve it, not as a reflection of their character, but as a reflection of yours. Thank you. You start with the dollop of dogma and a liberal sprinkling of guilt A dose of self-loathing compounded by doubt This is how all the best monsters get built An ounce of repression beats a pound of self-worth Stir it in freely from the moment of birth Simmer in malice till the tender is callous And empathy falls from the bones of the callow sure to make clear the different and queer and not really human and really not welcome here heaven prefers thy penitent language denying the thriving content in their blemishes the soul must be punished for corporeal bliss no matter how natural or contractual it is condemn those who dare to find beauty within the proud and depraved invite vanity Rating and shaming are requisite spices. Gaslight till blinded, and love learns what spite is. Pervert the sacred and wield it to conquer. The vanquished will fall into molds, making monsters. Oh, we got a great lab with dysfunctional tech. Lots of beeping and buzzing and electrodes for necks. We perfected the science some call a black art. There's a market for misery, we're just doing our part. We're hand rolling, holy upholding the right. Keeping that straight, narrow path clean and white. The plate goes around for membership dues. For the glory of God and the seed in these pews. We got our own bank and advisors on stocks. 
a hot neon cross and stadium rock, a, a late show in video and a million in sound, a den where good white boys get saved and get found, uh, and get loud. The vices of vultures are pillars our culture Kneels at to worship its opulent plunder Entitlements plied, prying rights from our brothers The receipt, huh? the recipe proffered The recipe proffered congeals making monsters oh, Predators steep in the broth of our brewing Gnashing their teeth on the thoughts that they're chewing Unripened young, untouched uh, Unripened young, untouched on the vine Endless temptation, defenseless supine No need to feed on the flesh to consume them These monsters haunt minds to malign to refuse them Now well, they're claiming they blame the lies Claiming the blame lies in eyes of its victims The truth will soon define monsters as symptoms Well, you start with the dollop of dogma And a liberal sprinkling of guilt A dose of self-loathing compounded by doubt This is how all the best monsters get built good morning so I must first confess my ambivalence about even addressing this topic and further ambivalence about the tentative conclusions I've drawn from what I believe is a fair reading of the research literature in this area I'm a psychologist by training and by disposition, as I often say. I'm a scientist practitioner, which means as we look into the shadows of this topic, I'm looking for something real. I'm looking for some pegs to hang my thinking on, some way to understand where we find ourselves. So I begin with that. I will attempt to summarize the key findings from the research literature weave it together into something that makes some kind of sense, realizing all the while that fair-minded people can and will and have disagreed with me vociferously, loudly. But please know that I never, ever lose sight of the fact that how well we protect the most vulnerable among us, especially our little ones, is both our highest moral obligation and the best test of who we are as human beings and as a community. So, I also want to say, if there are victims, and I know there are in this room, of sexual molestation or, or assault, please let nothing I say in any way vitiate the fact that I am here to protect you, that we are here to protect you and love you and help you heal in any way we can, and that anything I say that may sound like sympathy for the devil is really just an attempt to better understand and to prevent that from happening to anybody else ever. So having said that, buckle up and please keep your hands and feet and mind inside the riot at all times. If you have rotten tomatoes, please check them at the door. <laughs> I wanna make a few points and then support them. First of which, and we've heard some of this already, pedophilia and sexual offending against children are two different things. In the same way that Desiring to strangle someone and actually murdering them are two very different things psychologically, morally, and legally. Desiring sexual conduct and contact with children must be distinguished from engaging in that behavior with children. Cohen, which is a very uh, prolific researcher in this arena, in 2017 showed that among nearly 600 child-attracted men in an online survey, 39% reported to have never offended, and about half of convicted sex offenders against children do not show a dominant sexual interest in children. Daubert found that 56% 50, of men with pedophilic sexual interests had never committed child sexual abuse or used child exploitative materials. Yet, 
44% of all reported sexual offenses were committed by men without fantasies with pedophilic contact. The point being, they are two very different things. By the way, those studies use a very direct method of, of measuring pedophilic interests. It's called plethysmography, where they actually look at blood flow to the penis while showing folks adult, and it's very graphic, but it's a very direct and very valid and reliable measure of how much sexual interest one has in various stimuli. So this is a, a very valid way of looking at, at sexual interest, by the way, and that's all I want to say about that. Um, I have to conclude that from this literature, as difficult as it is for me personally, as difficult as it can be for my colleagues therapeutically, it is possible and desirable, as Josie said, to accept a person with pedophilic interests while simultaneously condemning as abhorrent any sexual acts that are illegal or immoral or harmful, especially to vulnerable little ones. That's my first point. Second point, we should be aware that stigma-related stress may make mental health problems worse and thereby increase the risk of offending among those with pedophilic interests. This is a tough one, but true, I believe. A common misperception exists that ostracizing people with pedophilia is likely to help keep children safe, and there's research to that effect. But the reality is that heaping shame on people for their sexual or emotional attraction to children may only ramp up already existing risk factors for sexual offending, including poor mental health, social isolation, etc. Even, even those at low risk of offending because of good behavioral control strong motivations not to offend, etc. Even those are, more, are very likely to face strong motivations, excuse me, they're very likely to face um, major problems if they make their sexual interests known, as you can imagine. They're likely to lose partners, they're likely to lose friends, they're likely to use com lose community, they're likely to lose financial uh, resources, jobs, etc. They're also likely to be, uh, obviously, the threat, uh, uh, subject of threats, target of threats, frequent ones, for physical safety. Research has well established that social stressors related to stigma and prejudice contribute to higher prevalence of mental disorders. Since we can hardly think of, of any circumstance or stronger stigma than the one we attach to pedophilia, experiences of stress are likely to be even more pointed for those folks contributing to higher rates of psychopathology, which we know, again, is a risk factor for offending. On a related note, when social acceptance seems unattainable due to stigma, people with pedophilia might be more tempted to embrace subcultural values legitimizing adult child sex as a coping mechanism. Let that one sink in for a second. And we have evidence that that is, in fact, true. To the extent that we cannot talk about these things, to the extent that we are shamed into remaining silent, driving in the uh, conversations with a pedophile, I think illustrates that perfectly. As the wisdom lessons, and David said, you know, uh, quoting Alan, the guy in the book, he was driven to believe that he could do anything without shame or remorse in a subcultural fashion. So to me, it seems that we should address stigma and help pedophilic individuals deal with the potential repercussions in the interest of what? In the interest of them remaining offense-free. My third point, stigmatizing people with pedophilia represents a barrier to treatment. Speaking of living an offense-free life, that's usually and appropriately the primary treatment goal for those with sexual interest in children. It stands to reason because, to my knowledge, there is no method to selectively reduce or eliminate sexual attraction to children. It doesn't exist to my knowledge. Maybe, maybe there is, but I've never seen it. And I think if we reflect on, on sexuality, and realize that it, it either occurs, that what, what turns us on, so to speak, is either formed and, and fully in place so early um, or evolves so slowly in, in, in some sense, that we, we, we really have a sense of not having a choice about what turns us on, so to speak. We ought to be able to talk about that, especially when it comes to pedophilia. So current treatment protocols typically focus on diminishing risk factors for child sexual abuse. However, not surprisingly, treatment opportunities for individuals such as these are few and far between. 
I'm so glad Josie has the interest and the emotional fortitude and the constitution to deal with folks in this vein because a lot of people don't. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Again, it stands to reason because seeking treatment for pedophilia may have disastrous consequences, as I've mentioned, legally, socially, financially, familially, especially with mandated reporter laws in effect. And again, I'm not arguing against those. But by creating an unfortunate bottleneck of circumstances where those with pedophilia have little or no access to psychotherapy and are systemically discouraged from seeking it, ingrained structural stigma is likely undermining our efforts to prevent sexual offending. Next point. Mental health practitioners need to become aware of their own stigmatizing attitudes. This is hard for me. As my attitudes were formed pretty early in my psychological career, I worked quite a lot and intensely with sexually abused and molested children from ages 5 to 17 or so. And I had to come to grips with a certain murderous rage that would sometimes overtake my thoughts. Thoughts that included vivid mental images of my hands around the necks of known abusers of the beautiful children that were in my care. I mean, I could see it. I could see it very clearly. And I used to hear Mark 9.42 run through my head a lot, where Jesus issued the very stern warning, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and he'd be cast into the sea. That's from the Prince of Peace, folks. I used to hear that a lot in my head when I would deal with these folks, these families, where I would do this great work with them and then put them right back into that circumstance. But hopefully, in the intervening years, I've learned a thing or two about how little my rage or society's fear and rage actually can help a single child ever be harmed from being harmed by a, by a pedophile. Since psychologists and other mental health professionals are part of the culture that rejects and demonizes people with pedophilic sexual interests, we really ought to take seriously the issues at hand. Biased or blanket negative assumptions may exist explicitly or implicitly. And if so, they are very likely to interfere with successful treatment outcomes. We should know and appreciate that clients with pedophilia may pursue psychotherapy for a number of reasons, um, at least outside of forensic settings like prisons, uh, where they are, um, uh, you know, kind of forced to uh, attend therapy sessions on a regular basis. Some seek treatment because they have problems controlling their sexual urges or finding appropriate ways to achieve sexual satisfaction, while others may be struggling to develop a positive sexual identity or to find ways to share their sexual interests with close friends or family members. We have to watch our biases, and I'm talking about us as mental health practitioners, but uh, the community at large as well. And be careful not to betray um, those seeking treatment before we have a chance to help them. For example, when we, when we fail to believe um, what sometimes are called virtuous pedophiles, assertions that they have never perpetrated and never would against children, to fail to believe them at the outset threatens invariably therapeutic alliance and thereby treatment outcomes. A couple of more points, including closing with what I hope will be more hopeful, uh, at least more um, syntonic or uh, easily digestible. Uh, hopeful information. Why we should try to reduce the stigma of pedophilia. And we have to continue. I always answer, ask myself the question as I'm preparing these remarks, uh, since we've done that song, Sympathy for the Devil, here. Is sympathy, is empathy with those with pedophilic interest, is that this tantamount to, equivalent to, sympathy for the devil? And uh, believe me, on a given day, I, I waffle. But... It is my considered opinion, uh, with which you are free to disagree, of course, that we, psychologists, therapists, healthcare community, the faith community, the community at large, we should seek to destigmatize, and that word is loaded, pedophilia, and treat human beings who have these sexual interests with respect and empathy. You remember my first point, pedophilia and sexual offending, two different things. We need to take great care in separating sexual interests and criminal behavior when speaking of or writing about pedophilia. Research findings based on incarcerated offender samples, which is the vast majority of the research, often the case, should not be generalized in a facile fashion to the general public. For these reasons, explicitly referring to pedophilia as a sexual orientation of sorts, separating it from sexual offending in the latest edition of the DSM, 
which is the psychiatric bible of the American Psychiatric Association. I think, on balance, that's a good step in the right direction, and one that we should not walk back in the face of pressures from a misinformed or highly inflamed public, public about the matter. Now I switch gears to what the science tells us about, what our clinical information in science tells us about, what can we do for the victims of sexual offenders? A less controversial and perhaps more hopeful subject. Of what actually works with helping victims of sexual assault and abuse to heal? I am gratified to work mostly for the last 25 years in community behavioral health, wherein in the last couple of decades, especially the last 10 years or so, a new way of looking at trauma has emerged, where we no longer ask, and I say no longer, we do, we still have uh, this happening, but uh, the, the new approach when folks come in for help is not to ask, what is wrong with you? But rather, what happened to you? That's the essence of trauma-informed care, as they call it, right? So there's a lot of good research on the fact that this is the way to help people heal most effectively. Therapists once believed trauma survivors required years of treatment, yet we now know from good research that actually relatively brief interventions can yield long-term gains in psychosocial, psychological functioning for child and adult victims of sexual trauma. It's what we call evidence-based care. We've heard about evidence-based faith here. This is evidence-based care for those who have been victims of trauma. There are a number of clinically and research-tested models for treating trauma that have gained, accept gained acceptance in the behavioral health community, including ones called, and I won't get into this, this is at least an entire weekend seminar, but um, things called prolonged exposure, cognitive processing therapy. There's one called, I'm sure you've heard of this, it's kind of wiggy for some people, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. Yeah, interesting, right? I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that, not much. And uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy in which um, Josie is um, well-trained and certified, to name a few. So I'll say a word or two about them just very briefly. Uh, prolonged exposure, what's that all about? Typically about nine to 12 sessions, last about 90 minutes each, in which the therapist repeatedly asks the patient to describe the traumatic event as if it were occurring. This is based the old behavioral habituation getting used to it kind of model, prolonged exposure. That's the fundamental psychological and behavioral principle underneath it. And the fact is, it works. Um, it identifies hot spots that then have to be repeated, if you will, in the safe space with the therapist. It has the effect of increasing trauma victims' sense of control. And again, avoidance is the number one problem, both in prevention and in treatment. This has the effect of increasing folks' control and ability to prevent the generalization of the trauma to other domains of life, which is often a problem. This is where you get debilitation from trauma, is when you generalize from one very horrific event to all of life. Prolonged exposure is effective in helping that. A lot of folks aren't trained in this, unfortunately. It's hard to find people who are trained in these evidence-based practices. It takes training, it takes supervision, it takes a commitment, and that's why trauma-informed therapy is so important. Cognitive processing therapy, I won't say much about that, but it's based on information processing theory, this psychological model essentially where you're doing exactly that, um, bringing up those memories to which you attach very particular emotional content. Patients learn to change or replace the cognitive distortions that we all tend to develop over time, uh, which therapists often call stuck points or rules of thinking, with more adaptive and healthier beliefs. EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. This is a fun one for me uh, because it goes to, it's, it's developed by a, a psychologist named Francine Shapiro who, who realized early on actually some research on what happens during REM sleep, you know, when your eyes are darting back and forth and up and down and so forth, that that's often uh, attached to, obviously, um, very um, troubling images that you're seeing while asleep in your brain, right? And so she's like, well, what? And there actually seems to be a connection to waking life as well. So EMDR, in, in essence, uh, another evidence-based practice, is we have a, a therapist who actually has you watch the fingers, go back and forth, back and forth, while you're recounting these uh, traumatic events. So it allows a little bit of neurological and psychological remove from the, from the uh, event that you're recounting. Uh, 
And there's a lot more to it than that. But that's sort of the active ingredient of it. There seems to be a way, uh, my reading of the research on it is essentially it's rewiring the brain so that you can deal with the, the trauma and find a new place for it neurologically, psychologically, emotionally, etc. And finally, I just want to say a word about trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and I know this is not something you normally hear about at church, and I'm sorry for wading into the weeds a little bit on this, but Roger wanted me to talk about what's, what's hopeful. And what's hopeful is that folks find healing, that folks, families and children and adult, adults who used to be children, find healing and hope in these methods that sound so, um, you know, when, when we call them evidence-based practices, that sounds so maybe cookbooky or whatever, but it's not. This is about of human beings finding healing through evidence-based, science-based, research-based protocols that seem, don't seem, they're demonstrated to work. So that's why I think this is the most hopeful place to, to kind of wind up this talk. Trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy is one brand of so-called cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the most researched and most effective kind of therapy in the history of therapy. Um, and it addresses the negative effects of sexual abuse, exposure to domestic violence, other traumatic events, by integrating several different therapeutic approaches and treating both the child and the parent in a comprehensive manner. It's a short-term treatment, typically, you know, over 12 to 18 sessions, 50 to 90 minutes each, depending on the treatment needs. Each individual session is designed to build on a particular therapeutic relationship while providing education, skills, and most importantly, perhaps, a safe environment in which to address and process traumatic memories. They hold joint parent-child sessions where, uh, designed to help children and parents practice the skills that they've learned, help the child to share and develop their own personal trauma narrative while fostering effective, supportive relationships between parents and children, caregivers and children. And of course, generally, the goals are to reduce that sometimes a very horrible, negative, emotional, behavioral responses to trauma that especially children have at times, um, but that can last for many, many years, 60 years even. Corrective, another goal is corrective, uh, correcting maladaptive or unhelpful, unhelpful beliefs about the traumatic experience. Most particularly, one of the most common ones, that it was somehow my fault, that I brought it on myself, um, that I am, in fact, um, responsible for what happened to me. That often takes a long time to correct. And finally, also to provide support and skills to help parents cope effectively with their own emotional distress, because this happens, as I, as I said, my early experiences clinically in this um, formed that opinion that you cannot deal with this in a crucible where the therapist and the child interact and then you, forever how long, and then place them back into the, the family system. Uh, without addressing the needs of the, the entire family system, especially the parents as they seek to support their kids through the healing process. So that's the hope. Um, but I find hope in all of it in a way. And I know, again, probably that first section was, has some of you scratching your heads or looking at me like I have two heads or like a dog looks at a fan um, or reaching for your rotten tomatoes. But um, again, I wish to reiterate uh, I hope nothing I've said in any way mitigates the fact that we have a fundamental responsibility to protect our children. I wish we had the halcyon days um, that Roger spoke of. I wish we'd never had to worry about the wolves that are, that are loose among us. But there are wolves among us. And unfortunately, it only takes one gap in the fence to let a wolf in. And, uh, you know, I've heard I was on the board of the Victim Center for years. I sang at the Victim Center uh, breakfast for 17 years in a row, raising money to help folks who had been sexually traumatized or abused, raped, etc. And we would hear these horrific stories. I'll never forget one that was in, in particularly still haunts me as I think about my own little girl uh, who was just at the home of a, a friend for a Super Bowl party and unsupervised for just a minute, you know, while they're watching the game, maybe the halftime show or something, and there's a bedroom down the hall, and uh, this little eight-year-old girl, you know, that's the wolf got through the fence one time. So hypervigilance <laughs> is not a bad thing. Unfortunately, we, if we wish to protect our children, we have to keep vigilant and even hypervigilant for, for these circumstances. But in no way should that also mitigate the other thing. And yes, I know it sounds ambivalent, but it's true. 
we have to look at people. I love the, and I'm hungry for pizza with pepperoni and mushrooms and, and uh, black olives now, but we need to look at individuals as human beings to prevent them from crossing the bridge to becoming monsters. You asked me to be liturgist today just to give a, another perspective to what we've been talking about and to speak from, I have lots of different experiences which I'll mention, but especially from the experience of someone who suffered from childhood sexual abuse and just knowing that in the number of people in this room, I'm not the only one. So uh, giving voice to us, saying all of our voices matter is, is quite important. So this is a little bit longer uh, offertory statement. I promise my invitation to communion is it's one paragraph. So if you could just won't, won't be doing this twice. Okay. Pedophilia and child sexual abuse are topics that we're not used to discussing at all, as we've been talking about, let alone discussing it in public, which is why I think that Roger has gone out of his way to include multiple voices here today. We need all of these perspectives. We need pastors, researchers, practitioners, parents, survivors, artists. And for myself, I've also dealt with this issue on multiple levels. I experienced sexual abuse as a child. I've worked with both perpetrators and victims while providing pastoral care. I've also worked with people who experience pedophilic inclinations. I've been a foster parent to children who experience childhood sexual abuse. I've been an artist who channeled anger and grief and healing and hope into music and writing. All, as all of us know, though, life doesn't usually ask permission for the pain and loss that it doles out. But what strikes me really powerfully, what, maybe what strikes me most in these kinds of conversations when we have them is one, healing isn't automatic, it's not inevitable. And two, we have managed to create a society and culture that too actively works against the healing of victims and of perpetrators. I think this is a lot of what we've been talking about this morning and maybe most powerfully put into words when Paul was saying he had to come to grips with a certain murderous rage he felt when learning about abusers' actions. But I want to widen the, that net to include our, a little bit of our larger culture this morning because most of us are not psychologists clinical psychologists, and that I think the larger culture is where a lot of us are going to be spending our time living and doing our work, and if we want to make an impact, we think in, in also in terms of where we fit into this picture. Anecdotally, we know that what I experienced growing up is still way too commonly experienced by folk that I continue to work with in conflict coaching and workshops and support groups. Statistically, we've read a lot of, of numbers from the stage already today, and I have in the past. I want to share one other one from January 2018 to add to this catalog. Stop Street Harassment and Reliance, this is a collaborative that works together to end sexual violence, surveyed 2,000 people, and the numbers, they, they pretty wide uh, definition of of uh, sexual harassment and assault. 81% of women survey had experienced that. 43% of men uh, had said they had experienced that. More than half, and this is where it gets especially relevant to this morning's conversation, more than half, 57% of women, and nearly half, 42% of men, said their first experience of sexual harassment or assault occurred by the age of 17. 30% of women and 22% of men said that their experience occurred before the age of 13. And further, both, again, statistically and anecdotally, the reality is that most sex abusers are never discovered, let alone treated. That's part of the stigma we've been discussing. Here's the reality. You already know people with, you probably have met people with pedophilic inclinations who have not been able to access help for that because of the stigma. Some estimates have gone as high as 90% of all sex offenders are living in communities nationwide without having ever been charged for a crime as well. So even the people who do offend, most of them are, are hidden in our society. I talk a lot about shifting social norms, and it applies here too. I think we want to act like sex abuse is uncommon because we're socially trained, as we've been discussing, to think that it's disgusting and it's shocking, and it's so disgusting and shocking that it surely can't happen, and therefore it surely doesn't 
happen. And when we're confronted with the reality that it does happen, we just want it to go away. We substitute silencing victims and demonizing perpetrators for the very difficult work of transforming our cultures and creating communities that are actually healthy and safe. It's very difficult because our social norms have provided very few accessible ways, policies, processes, resources, and professionals to do anything practical to prevent, address, and heal sexual abuse. And as a way of summary, what we've discussed here this morning, here's what we do instead. We feel angry. Retribution is our most common cultural pathway, and no one elicits the disgust and violence of the mob like a sexual predator who preys on children. But retribution centers the perpetrator and does very little to support and heal the victim or the community, let alone healing the perpetrator. It wants to punish the perpetrator. We need to move from retributive models to transformative and restorative models. We feel ashamed. Conservative cultures are especially vulnerable to that deep shame and aversion that Josie was talking about when it comes to anything related to sex. Many victims of abuse are ignored simply because the adult hearing this stuff is ashamed and disgusted and responds by silencing the child. And, or in more, even more pronounced ways, the child learns to silence him or herself. We need to move from repressive sexual attitudes and practices to comprehensive, developmentally and age-appropriate sex education that includes bodily autonomy, sexual boundaries, and clear instructions about what to do if you're abused. Amen. We feel helpless. We don't like to experience things that we don't know what to do about, that we don't know how to deal with. Even if we think that those things are wrong, we just we don't like to feel helpless. But because our society focuses on retribution, and because most sexual abuse is perpetrated by people that we or our families or coworkers know and care about, we simply don't know what to do. I've heard it a refrain so many times, I don't want to ruin so-and-so's life. Or you can't talk about this, it will ruin so-and-so's life. Your aunt or your cousin will be heartbroken if they found out what happened. We feel helpless, we don't know what to do because retribution is our only option. Or when perpetrators are prominent and powerful people in our lives or in a community, we can be afraid of the consequences of confronting them. So we do nothing, or we silence those who do try to speak because we're afraid, I hear this a lot too, we're afraid that it's just gonna make things worse, right? And we'll feel even more helpless then. We need to move from those victim blaming and cultures of silence to victim centered models that Paul was talking about that normalize trauma informed care and make that kind of care universally available. The Me Too movement has, I think, largely been aiming at shifting these kinds of norms in society by normalizing these kinds of conversations. But ignorance and repression is pushing back, and I think this is an important thing to note. Um, the wider culture is dictating how we can talk about things like this, and sexual assault in general, sexual abuse of children in particular, pedophilia included. The Economist, con the Economist conducted surveys one year apart, polling 1,500 U.S. residents to track some of the cultural responses to the Me Too movement's goals of normalizing conversations about sexual assault. And this is what they said. When it came to questions about the consequences of sexual assault and misconduct, there was a small but clear shift against victims. That is the cultural dynamic that we're living with right now. There is a small but clear shift against victims. So one of, one of those included that 18% of Americans now think that false accusations of sexual assault are a bigger problem than attacks that go unreported or unpunished. And again, to bring in the, the cultural side of these things, those who were on the more conservative side of the spectrum, uh, people who identified as Trump supporters, said there was a full 50% of Trump supporters that indicated that they believed that women who complain about sexual harassment cause more problems than they solve. That's the reality of our, our, of our culture right now. It's victim blaming, it's rape culture, 
It's the kind of attitudes that translate into families, schools, churches, and communities that empower and enable sexual predators, that leave people with pedophilic inclinations to be stigmatized and ashamed and, and without any access to resources or healing. When we talk about shifting social norms, we need to remember that we're talking about engaging with deeply held, mainly patriarchal values, attitudes, behaviors, and institutions that resist change. Again, I think that most of us are really uncomfortable with the idea of just how prevalent sexual assault and abuse continues to be, including the abuse of children, and our patriarchal culture makes it so easy, very easy, to fall into those well-worn patterns of helplessness, anger, and shame. So we continue to have a whole lot of work ahead of us in our hearts, in our homes, churches, schools, workplaces, communities, and cultures. I don't believe that it's possible to create communities that are completely immune to abuse. But I do think that it is very possible to create communities where the risks of abuse are greatly minimized and where when abuse does occur, people can easily and simply seek and receive the help they need as victims and as perpetrators. I think it's possible to create communities where everyone grows up learning about healthy sexuality and where everyone grows up learning about the resources that are available for preventing uh, sexual misconduct and assault and abuse and for healing for that abuse when it does happen. So I'll say again, foremost in my mind as I think about us as what we can support and advocate for as a community, we need to move to transformative and restorative models of justice we need to move to comprehensive, developmentally, and age-appropriate sex education that includes all these things we've been talking about, bodily autonomy, sexual boundaries, clear instructions for what to do if you are abused. And we need to move, move to victim-centered models that normalize trauma-informed care and make that care universally available. Conversations like these are a really important, vital part of that process. We have to normalize talking about sexual abuse. We have to normalize pointing to practical changes that we can make in our culture, in our communities, and policies at work, and school, and at home. And for that, we need places and spaces that make those conversations possible because wider culture is not disposed to letting those conversations take place. I know that we as a community, I know that I personally am deeply appreciate and value the work we do together as a faith community to make conversations like this possible. And that's why I'm happy to support it in whatever ways that I can, including giving financially each Sunday. So thank you all. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.